Um, hello, everyone. I'm In Zhang, the chair of the Capacity Building Subcommittee of the WHO Civil Society Working Group on Health and Climate Change, and Associate Professor at the University of Sydney, Australia. It's my privilege and great pleasure on behalf of the team to welcome you and thank you very much for joining the launch of the special call for strengthening climate and health education for all health professionals from all um, different, um, different time zones across the world. Thank you very much. And this event is co-hosted by the WHO Working Group and the Global Consortium of Climate and Health Education. And please note that we are going to record the session and circulate the link afterwards. And um, we will have some time towards the end to address all your questions, um, hopefully. And I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, study, and work, and pay my respect to their um, elders past, present, and emerging. I am now speaking from the Camarago land in Sydney. Um, climate change is a health emergency as reflected in the devastating consequences of the unprecedented heat waves, floods, um, cyclones, and other um, extreme weather events. Uh, responses to a uh, global health emergency, whether a uh, pandemic or a uh, climate disaster, need a highly proactive, skilled, and committed health workforce. Um, one of the strategies to achieve this is um, strengthening education and training programs for them. And that is the purpose of this call, um, so that we could better prepare and respond to climate disasters. And more specifically, in this open letter, which was developed by the WHO Working Group and in consultation with education stakeholders, we are calling on associate deans, academics, and other teaching staff um, of health professional um, um, educational institutes as well as associated examination and accreditation agencies to act uh, with urgency on the following um, four key points. Um, to integrate climate and health competencies into all health professional cur uh, curricula, accreditations, and continuing professional development programs. To provide a health lens to support the development of educational programs on climate change in other sectors to foster multi-sectoral collaborations. To advocate for and provide additional funding and resources for climate and health research and education. And to share resources and expand um, the educational opportunities, especially for capacity building in resource poor settings. So the full text of um, this open letter is available uh, now as we are launching today, um, which has highlighted the requests from us and also includes some useful uh, resources and examples of climate and health education programs to inspire and ho hopefully bring on more um, local changes. And today's session, uh, we'll hear from guest speakers and panel discussions on why this is important and how we could work together to achieve this from different disciplines and perspectives. So without um, further ado, um, I'd like to invite our first guest speaker, Dr. Darbit campbell Linger, the head of the WHO Climate Change Unit. And thank you. Over to you, Darren. Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction and, and the opportunity to speak here today. I, I'd just like to, to thank the, the colleagues from the, the Civil Society Working Group. Um, it, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to work with you over about five years now since this was formally constituted and um, to work with the GCHA as the umbrella organization, but really all of the organizations that, that participate in that group and, and the wider community, which is now really bringing the full force of the health uh, professional community to act on climate change. And I think the, the, the question that you're posing is, is why do we think this is important? Um, I don't, hopefully nobody on this call needs convincing about why the links between climate change and health are important. Um, it's about 15 years now since our director general identify climate change as potentially the greatest health threat of the of the 21st century. We've seen that on the front cover of The Lancet. It's, it's now, I think, widely accepted uh, throughout the health community just how 
big of a challenge this is. Um, and we have urgent things that we need to do to address climate change. Um, so we need to increase the resilience of our health systems to protect people from the health impacts of climate change. Um, we have to cut emissions and we have to cut them fast. The good news is that will bring a, a great deal of, of very large health benefits. And we also have to model that through what we do um, as health professionals and you know, health professionals is one of the, the largest professional bodies in, in the world, probably the most trusted professional body in the world, embedded in every community almost uh, throughout the world. So it really matters what, what we do as well as what we say. So we have to, uh, to, to model that if, yeah, if you like. Um, and in addition to doing these urgent things, uh, we also have to support the, the health professionals of the future. Um, the, we're also seeing this as a demand from the health professionals uh, of the future, that their, that their training should in, include uh, climate change. Um, if we are consistent about saying how much, how big of a threat this, this is, then we absolutely have to include it uh, within our training. I would say the, the, the equivalent is, is to, to acknowledge that heart disease is the, the biggest acute killer that we have and running training programs for emergency physicians and not mentioning heart disease. But we think climate change is that big of a threat across to the health of people across the world. And it, and it should be um, the business of all branches of, uh, of health workers. And I'm seeing things in the chat saying, you know, for example, yes, dentists too, yes, pharmacists too. We think it applies to all of those, uh, those health professions because it is a systemic challenge uh, to the health of uh, the planet and the people on, uh, on the planet. Um, I'm pleased to say that at the World Health Organization, we have been talking about this issue in general for a, for a long period of time, um, but we're also continuing to push it higher up the agenda. And so at, at our executive board meeting at the beginning of this year, our director general was laying out his priorities for a second five years in office. Um, we, to simplify things, WHO says we, we need to do three things with health in the world. Uh, one is to provide universal health coverage. The second is to prevent people from um, shocks, pandemics, natural disasters, and so on. The third is to is prevention and promotion, keeping people healthy in the first place. Um, what Dr. Tedros is doing is to shift that number three to the front and say we want to spend more time keeping people healthy and safe, and then think about you know what what we need to do in terms of treatment and so on. And within that, he's identifying climate change as as the the top priority within that. So we are consistent in saying this needs to be right at the forefront and it needs to be at the forefront, therefore, of the health professionals that we train up for the, uh, for the future. The final thing I'd, I'd like to say is just to acknowledge the, the very um, positive work that has come through, particularly in the last few years. Um, there are several initiatives and you'll hear from several of them today, but also the demand that we're seeing, the, the, you know, the, the understandable and rightful demand from the health professionals of the future from you know, young medical professionals, but across the health professions, demanding that, that climate change be included in, the, in their training and actually rating um, training courses around the world or medical curricula around the world to, 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 you know, to grade them so as to the extent to which they include climate change. I think that's an extremely positive thing um, that the next generation who uh, will be the most affected and, and as health professionals, unfortunately most implicated in cleaning up the mess of climate change or the damage that it does are insisting that they should be trained on, on this issue and, and, and quite rightly so. So with that I'll, I'll hand back to the chair and, and just to, to thank you once again for your collaboration and uh, we're fully behind this initiative and really looking forward to a, to a good discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you Dermot um, for your leadership and the WHO's team's efforts to um, strongly push health into the center of the global climate change agenda, which actually um, motivate us all to continue working in the field. Um, I know there um, may be some questions from the audience and we will leave um, some time towards the end to address them, uh, if you don't mind. So now um, please welcome Associate Professor Cecilia um, Sorison the director of the Global Consortium of Climate and Health Education at Columbia University to share her views. And thank thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. It's really, really exciting to be here today and it's an honor to support the launch of this letter. It's such an important step and it's incredible to see people coming together from all over um, for this reason. 
So we know, as Jeremy mentioned, that you know, climate change is one of the biggest global health threats of the 21st century. But at the same time, we know that if we tackle climate change, it could be the greatest global health opportunity by improving health now, as well as for future generations and reaping incredible gains to health for our generation. However, you know, in order to turn this, this huge threat into an opportunity, what we need is a health professional workforce who is trained to prepare for, prevent, and respond to climate related health impacts globally. Otherwise, how are we going to get from this threat to this opportunity? We know from the most recent IPCC report that the severity of climate related health risks is highly dependent on how well health systems can protect people. And we as doctors, nurses, dentists, um, mental health professionals, social workers, uh, veterinarians, I, I, I want to list every single type of health professional, we are standing um, on the forefront of this and our response, if it happens appropriately, has the incredible ability to really change the course of health now and in the future. And so where I am at the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, our mission is to ensure that 100% of health professionals globally have the knowledge and skills to recognize, respond to, and prevent climate-related health impacts. And so we go about this by obtaining commitments from health professional schools. We go to the dean or head of school and we ask for their pledge to train their students in climate and health and in planetary health. We also bring together member institutions to create and share best scientific practices. We need to act fast and we don't all need to be inventing the wheel. So we do a lot of dissemination of resources and sharing and collaboration. And we work towards developing global standards um, that can be used to guide curricular development um, in many different spheres. And then we work to build a pipeline of health professionals who focus their work on climate and health. So this is us. We currently have 270 health professional schools in over 50 different countries who have pledged to train their students in this. So we're reaching approximately 175,000 students annually, which is incredibly exciting. Our schools come from backgrounds of nursing, of dentistry, of medicine, of public health, of social work, and of pharmacy, and of veterinary medicine. And we have incredible partners who we work with to, to promote this work. And just some of them are listed here. We have many more. So we invite you to join us on this journey. We have incredible initiatives that we're working towards and we really need an all hands on deck approach to this. So I will put the link in the chat. Um, it's completely free to join and you can participate however you choose. So just to give you a little bit of an example of some of the work that we're doing, we develop toolkits and frameworks. We have courses, we have ongoing um, Grand Round style lecture series. We have a virtual town square for collaboration. We do advocacy. And of course, last but not least, we are um, student um, I don't know, students run this, they run me, um, they tell us what needs to happen and they are really out in front of so much of this work. So as one of our core functions, we produce and iterate a list of core competencies for health professionals that really relates to what we see as their, their roles and responsibilities in responding to the climate and health crisis. These competencies are created by an interdisciplinary work team at the GCCHE and are vetted by all our members. You can see here briefly what they cover and you can find more information about this on our website. So this really lays out tons of resources and an approach that can be taken to really develop that climate informed health workforce, no matter what type of health professional is coming to the table. Really excitingly, recently in collaboration with the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health in North America, we developed and launched a toolkit for specifically how to integrate climate and planetary health into the training of public health professionals, um, where we outline how you can integrate climate and planetary health into core curriculum, how you can build a course, and how you can build a degree program. And similarly, ASFR um, in Europe is using the competencies um, as a guide for training health professionals in Europe. I just got news today that the uh, sustainable healthcare has just been added by the UK a medical regulator to the document which outlines what doctors need to know in order to graduate. And that's really exciting. And I know a tremendous work went into this. Um, not only is this the world's first nationally endorsed curriculum for teaching planetary health, it's also a comprehensive resource for health professional educators. And that it will be available on our website as well. So we're working hard across the globe to ensure that faculty and practicing clinicians and educators are prepared to teach and prepared to lead. This spring, we offered three free CME accredited certificate-based courses for health professionals. 
Um, they took place in various different regions where we worked with regional partners and developed culturally appropriate content, which was taught by experts from the region um, in multiple languages. And so just this spring, we've trained over 5,000 health professionals and we continue to grow and expand this. And it's just been really exciting to see we're also working to accelerate research. We currently have, are supporting two open calls for papers, one in the AAMC Med Ed Journal and one in Frontiers of Public Health. So we really need to encourage um, you know, evidence-based learning, evidence-based sharing, and this is one way we're doing it. And so last but not least, you know, our students are out in front of this and I just wanna share a video that our students made um, that they launched during Earth Day and really I think speaks to the need as to why we are here today. Dear health education leaders, as a public health student, as a pharmacy student, as a dietetic student, as a medical student, as a nursing student, as an epidemiologist in training, I feel ill-equipped to prevent the health harms of climate change my patients and communities face. In the recent months, climate change has fueled one of the most violent tropical storms ever faced by areas of my country that are usually spared. Here in Richmond, Virginia, Heat waves affect communities of color and low income neighborhoods disproportionately. And yet, I'm not taught what that means for their health. The evidence is clear for more frequent and severe wildfires to floods and droughts, poor air quality and increased spread of infectious diseases. Climate change is the greatest threat to health that we face in the 21st century. The COVID-19 pandemic has already highlighted the unprecedented strain that large-scale health crises place on health systems and healthcare workers. And low-income communities of color, indigenous communities will suffer the worst consequences. A whole generation of nurses and nurse practitioners. A whole generation of doctors. A whole generation of pharmacists will have to care for those who suffer from the health harms of climate change. Yet there's little formal acknowledgement of the coming climate catastrophe in our education. But the solutions we need already exist. The Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education has resources and frameworks for educating all health professionals. Our health education encourages us to think deeply and collaboratively about the health problems we face. And climate change is no different. Educating us on the impacts of climate, on organ systems, structural determinants of health, health policy, and health system science is an opportunity. To prepare us to face the challenges of a lifetime. But we need your help to make it a reality. We need your leadership to push for sweeping educational reform. Required to prepare a generation of healthcare providers to address the consequences of climate change. If schools integrate the impacts of climate change on health into existing curricula, then as an epidemiologist, I will be able to better understand the interaction of climate change with health risks and health outcomes. As a physician, I will be able to talk with my patients about the impact climate change is having on them. As a nurse, I will be able to provide heat action plan for my patients in a heat room. We, as health professional students, will spend the entirety of our careers working with patients and in communities increasingly impacted by climate change and environmental degradation. With the proper training, we can fulfill our duties as health professionals, secure the health of our patients, and achieve a more just society. So thank you all so much and uh, back over to you, Yang. And thank you, Cecilia and the GCCHE for leading the way in pushing climate and health contents into the um, health and medical curricula. And the UK's example is um, really leading the way and set up example for other countries to follow. And and here, here, you know, hear the, the voices from the students that we cannot ignore anymore as the demand is real and, and urgent and increasing that we need to address and to face together. So now um, I will hand over to Professor Lane Maiden to moderate the panel discussion. Um, Professor Lane Maiden is the first professor of population and planetary health and associate dean and school of medicine, the University of Notre Dame, Australia. She is also the chair of the Health Education and Training Institute Higher Education Academic Board at the um, New South Wales government. And over to you, Lee. Thanks very much, Ying. And uh, we have a fantastic panel of speakers with whom to explore the issues raised in the letter um, this evening. And I'll start by introducing the panelists and then 
we'll pose one or two questions to each of them. So uh, firstly, we have uh, Mohammed Isa, who's liaison officer for public health issues with the International Federation of Medical Students Association. Um, we have Amina El Omrani, who is a plastic and reconstructive surgery uh, resident at Anne Shams University. Um, we have Maya Floss, who is with, uh, who's from Wonka International, the World, World Organization of Family Doctors. She is also a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and Ying Sun Chen is chairperson of public health for the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation and also a research associate with Columbia University Pediatrics Infectious Diseases. So, Mohammed. The first question is for you. Can you summarize the findings of the Federation's survey of medical programs around the world for the inclusion of climate and health in the curricula for medical students, please? Yes, thank you so much for the question. Can you confirm that you can hear me well? Thank you, Mohammed. yes. Yes, perfect. So yeah, uh, back in 2019 in March, our survey regarding climate change in medical curriculum and actually my predecessor in my position is here with us uh, she was the one leading this so uh, we had our first phase which was like analyzing the current state of climate change and health in the curriculum we received responses from 104 uh, sorry 107 countries where 32 percent reported that there was no mandatory or informal element regarding climate change and health in their curricula while 28% mentioned that there were problem-based learning cases or lectures dedicated to the topic every year or in one year of their medical curriculum. And then the second phase of the survey took place in August 2019, where we surveyed 2,817 medical schools in 108 countries, and 14.7 of the medical schools included climate change and health in the curriculum, which is a very, very low percentage in terms of the crisis that we're facing when it comes to climate change. And 12% of the schools, there were formal education, but rather student-led activities. And then we had a final survey in March 2020, where we had the focus on the integration of health impacts of air pollution in the curriculum. And we received responses from 112 countries. And only 11% had formal education on the topic of air pollution. And 5% had student-led or informal activity on air pollution and 20% there were both formal as well as, well as student-led activities. So all these like different percentages and all these low, I would say, percentages emphasize the fact that we're not doing enough, we're even doing much less than the enough when it comes to educating the uh, healthcare profession uh, in terms of the climate change and health in order to be able to be competent enough when it comes to treating patients or even preventing diseases. So this led to several actions when it comes to climate change uh, and health in the medical curriculum and i'm very happy that i'm present here today to witness the launch of a call uh, to different stakeholders in terms of the change in education the curriculum in general thank you so much thanks mohammed very much indeed so the next couple of questions are directed to um nia so um how are you seeing the impacts of climate change on the health of your patients and on the health system that you work in as a first question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be part of this event today that focuses on integrating climate change in the curriculum. Uh, the main reason is now I'm finishing off my first year as a surgery resident, and I'm basically every day at the ER. And it's not one day that passes where I see patients either complaining of uh, bronchitis or lung diseases, ranging from pneumonia, asthma, even preparing them for surgery. This is the most common comorbidity that I see every day. Uh, as the temperature now is increasing, we see in the ER an increasing rate of heat stroke and heat stress. Uh, due to the increasing temperature that even in Egypt, which is a, 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 a country that has high temperature, we're not getting used to so such a remarkable increase. And this makes me think about how, and when it comes to lung diseases, I live in Cairo, which is one of the, the capital city with the highest level of air pollution. And this has become the new normal here 
which means that climate change is not just impacting um, the health of communities as we are learning from one another, it's impacting the health of my people and my patients, and making them even unable to get the surgical care that they need because of the, 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 the non-communicable disease that they are suffering from, simply because of where they live, simply because of the air that they breathe. On the, on the other hand, I look at the seven years of education that I've been into, and I did not learn about climate change nor the impacts of the environment on human health, which was the main driver for me to uh, begin the survey that Mohammed has shared with Alphamacy and ask medical students like myself from countries around the world whether they learn about climate change or not. And this being right now as a Residents, I see myself and residents like myself as the first line responders to the impacts of climate change being in the ER. And we need to be uh, well prepared now more than ever to be to treat the, the, the impacts of health that we're going to see on climate change. Um, and to be resilient because we are part of the climate resilient healthcare system that we are aspiring towards accomplishment and towards uh, having it um, in the face of the climate crisis. Thanks, Amnia. I mean, you started to actually um, answer the second uh, question, which was how could doctors be better prepared through education programs to recognize and respond to these impacts? So there, are there some particular, um, uh, from, your, from your perspective now, um, as a resident, are there some particular things that education might have that an education program might have done to prepare you well? Yes, and I would like to quickly share a very inspiring story for me, uh, because because of the survey that um, that I did with the International Federation of Medical Students Association, and we had also the incredible support of the Association for Medical Education, Amy, where they gave us the opportunity to publish three papers in the Medical Teacher Journal focusing on sustainable healthcare education and climate change. Because of these publications, they reached um, um, one of the, the head of departments of medical education in my university, and they informed her that there's a student in Cairo uh, that worked on climate change. And then she reached out to me and she asked me if I can work with her to design the first ever uh, planetary health and climate change course for students in, in their third and in their fourth year, because she saw that this is the best time for students to start learning about climate change so that they can link it with the clinical work that they are doing, as well as the basic sciences that they are learning. And she said that this course, as we are planning it now, it's going to have a credit hours not so much, around three or four, but it's going to be a mandatory course. And she, we are going to launch it in September um, as a you know, preliminary, preliminary course for third year, third year students. And if it goes well, we are going to further standardize it and further evaluate it in a way that it can be integrated in a sustainable method. And the reason why I share this is now more than ever students are um, looking at their education and they're assessing how how they can be better prepared from a planetary health perspective. There are diversity of resources available to create this course. And now we also have the data that proves that we are not learning about climate change. So uh, my advice would be work with your deans, if not work with the most motivated uh, or interested director or educator. And you are, you're going to work together and with the students and you will be able to make that change even if it's for a single course even if it's for a single semester it's going to be simply the start of having climate change as part of the curriculum in addition to utilizing this letter as a way to prove that it's not just you or your uh, group of students or your uh, organization it's the entire global health community Thanks, Omnia. That's fantastic. And thank you um, to you and to Mohammed for your contributions um, over the years in getting us here. Um, so on to um, Mayara. Um, uh, you've been involved with the development of a free online planetary health for primary care course in Brazil. What were the challenges that you've faced in developing and promoting uh, this course? Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm really happy with this letter. Can you hear me well? Yeah. 
Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's a good story. I will share a bit. I mean, I started to research uh, on climate change in 2018. And then I was working with the data and seeing the graphics. And I was trying to communicate with my colleagues, other primary healthcare professionals and family doctors. And then I, I realized that when I start to talk, they feel that wasn't that important, that topic. That was a minor topic. Even if the data was very, very expressive. Then I need to get a little bit of courage to understand that I, I will need to change my focus. And I decided to not that I stop it to research on climate change at all, but I, I perceive it that I need to do uh, to educate people. And it was not just uh, health professionals. We started the course at uh, Brazilian uh, Portuguese version open to any community member that want to do that. So we had professor, professors, journalists, and us, it should be a course that's talking from the major health determinant of this, this era. So then, and but for sure, it was focused on health. And then the, the major public that came was, um, was health professionals. And uh, we translated it into English. And then after we translated it to, into English uh, with the help of, of Planetary Health Alliance, we reunited uh, health professionals from all around the world with a balance between low and middle income countries and high income countries to write a special course on planetary health for primary care. And since we, I started this uh, crazy run <laughs> to develop these courses and coordinate it with a free platform, a public platform based on the, on the right to education, uh, so it's accessible to anyone that wants to do that, we have over 2,000 uh, people that concluded the courses since 2020. And we will relaunch the courses in July 20, uh, uh, in July 15. So we'll all of them be open. It's, uh, uh, they are composed from seven to 10 modules that will uh, explain what is climate change, heat stress, air pollution, mental health, uh, water, uh, pro uh, water uh, problems, uh, infectious disease, and nutrition mainly. So it's been uh, a huge work, and mostly I'm doing it voluntarily. And uh, because I, I still working like a full week time as a primary care physician in a in a in a poor community. And uh, I do it like in my nights and in my uh, holidays and in my weekends, because I really think we should reach every health professional and not just health professionals, but our community, but for here, uh, health professionals to talk about this. And uh, from that, uh, we, I do have many other results. And, uh, but this year we started the, the first post-graduation course at where I'm doing my PhD is part of my PhD uh, thesis, I'm also doing this course. And we have 40 uh, mainly health professionals doing the course uh, as this post-graduation uh, part of their um, formation and, and, their, and their education. So this is what's going on in Brazil and actually in the world. And thank you for the question. Thanks, Mary. And one of your um, one of the people who've completed your course is actually has just uh, I'll pop that up in the chat. So um, you're being supported here by some of the people that have uh, engaged with your programs. Do you have any plans to evaluate the impacts of this and the successes of the course? We have published an article in Frontiers in the beginning of this year uh, from the first uh, pilot of the course in the Frontiers Public Health. I can share the, the link. I can share the link for the courses as well here. That'd be great. And, uh, yes, and, I also, and we are also, we evaluated the English version of it uh, or for folks in primary care. 
and uh, uh, we are waiting if the, 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 if the journal will accept it or not, but we keep evaluating and seeing it. And I decided to do my PhD on that. Even it's in on pathology, we are thinking that this is like education and changing how people see and understand diseases are really important for the future for us. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, and to our final panel member, and that's Ying Sun Chen. So um, Ying, as a pharmaceutical student, why is it important for you to understand the link between climate change and health? That's your first question, please. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, for your question. And uh, I think coming out of pharmacy school and uh, like working as a pharmacist, I realized that um, I know about uh, like almost nothing about the climate impact of on health, which is, which is really un unacceptable, really, because in comparison to physician only healthcare professionals, uh, pharmacists have this unique position that they're more local, so which make them more accessible to the patient and usually develop this longitudinal relationship with their communities. Uh, therefore, not knowing the impact of climate change on health uh, on their community actually like sabotage the sentinel function of pharmacists that will allow them to provide better patient care and or like either revert uh, their patient to appropriate resources for further support. So if you look across all pharmacy school in all countries, almost none of them are teaching pharmacy students about climate change. And not just about the climate change, uh, oh, because we can probably assume that almost every student know about climate change at this point. But what we need to discuss in the academic system uh, especially in the pharmacy school, is the climate change impact on human health, as well as what we as future pharmacists can do to support our patients. For example, non communicable disease such as obesity and cardiovascular diseases, and also infectious diseases like viral, bacterial, they're tightly linked to the environment context, like directly, indirectly. Therefore, it is absolutely essential for schools, not just medical school, but also pharmacy school to integrate less climate change into the curriculum. Um, and not as a standalone course, which is which a lot of medical programs uh, are doing right now. Um, it, provi it provides some benefits, but not a lot. And it actually adds more pressure on the, on the super pack like uh, training, training schedule. Uh, so what we need is an integrated climate change context in their training that will allow them to see the impact of climate change and integrate climate change in their clinical rationales, which will help them address the issue from foreign students. Thanks, Ying Chun. And I mean, you, once again, you've touched on um, in your answer um, what the, the, what's uh, this in this next question. But in particular, can you provide examples of how you might see yourself applying this learning in your pra in your future practice? Yes. So. Uh... A lot of pharmacists, uh, they, they work in their, in hospitals or uh, like in communities. Uh, for example, I work in uh, in academic hospitals. Uh, what like so so I I would say uh, by on understanding this knowledge, we, we would know this like it's through like different layers. So the first point would be like what is climate change, and which I, uh, a lot of people already know. Um, the second point would be how climate change impact human health. We we know their their air pollutions, PM two point five, PM ten. They are increasing uh, increasing like COPDs. We also know that a, lo a lot of climate change causing floods and uh, uh, disrupting the healthcare system. It actually increased uh, antimicrobial resistance, which uh, we study extensively uh, in in infectious disease. So like how pharmacists can then the next next level would be how we as pharmacists can address those issues caused by climate change. So um, understand, understanding the question why, what is causing AMR, uh, which like by by the climate change, we can we can adapt this like one health approach to, to help our patients to find appropriate resources, uh, either from the pharmacist side or from uh, from the uh, other healthcare professionals to address this together uh, interprofessionally. So, uh, so you can see that uh, this, is, uh, this is why we need this in our education system, and not just in school, but also in, in our postgraduate training. And this will help us as future uh, healthcare providers understand how to provide patient care in the future. Thank you very much indeed. And 
I'm actually going to move on to some questions and ask them to pairs of panelists. And the um, first one uh, is to Mohammed and to Amina. Uh, uh, given that uh, COP27 is going to be in your country this year, um, both Amina uh, and Mohammed are in Egypt. Uh, so what do you think we could do to highlight the requests in this letter uh, and amplify its impacts at COP27? Okay, maybe from my side, I would say it's very important to highlight successful examples and even not just successful examples, but examples of uh, like initiatives in progress when it comes to incorporating the climate change into the curriculum. For example, the example that Omnia mentioned in her own uh, university, examples from other countries, examples from different backgrounds. This is very much important in addition to specifying the steps that we need or specifying the certain action points that we need from the decision makers in order to implement this. Because what I have seen, for example, in COP26, when we go with general asks, sometimes they just ask us, okay, what do you want me exactly to do? So here comes our role that we need to bring them the case studies, we need to bring them the examples, and even the examples that are still in progress to show that this is something that can be happening. This is something that has certain steps that we need to follow in order to accomplish this. And it does not matter the background, it does not matter the country, it does not matter anything, because this is a crisis that is affecting everyone and it's very much important for everyone to get educated on it. So in conclusion, what we need to do, amplifying the examples, amplifying the case studies, whether already finalized or still in progress, in addition to identifying the exact steps that we need to do as, for example, let's say medical students, future healthcare professionals, etc., and what the decision makers need to do and show how we can work together, collaborate together in order to turn these action points into real life results when it comes to incorporating the climate change into the curriculum. Only through this way, we will be able to show them that, okay, this is successful, this is something doable, this is feasible, and this is how you do it, so you would just need to support us in doing it. So, yeah. Thanks, Mohammed, and I have no doubt that the International Federation of Medical Students Associations will be there at COP27, as you've been at all the other COPs, um, making the case for change. So thank you all for that. Um, now a question for Mayara and Ying Sun. Um, once again, you've touched on this, but what opportunities do you see for collaborations across disciplines? I mean, Ying, you you flagged that it's multidisciplinary and so did you, Mayor. Um, what do you see the opportunities for collaborations across disciplines, across departments, across sectors for strengthening climate change education for health professionals? Perhaps, um, Mayor, you go first, perhaps then Ying. Okay. Uh... There is one thing that we need, I, I have learned with studying about that. For us to get out of this crisis, it's a collective effort. It's not just like uh, doctors that will do that. Uh, we need all to be involved and with our community and our community health workers and with everybody, I really think primary care is uh, at the center of that because we are uh, very close to the community and uh, we are uh, close to uh, getting actions that can be done. In Porto Alegre, uh, we created like with uh, a group of doctors, something called uh, Alert Medicine. Uh, that is like a kind of um, evaluating like air pollution locally into the community. So this is one example of things. And we did it, it with engineers. We did it with uh, data scientists. So we couldn't do that alone. So collaboration is essential for us to get out of this crisis. So uh, we cannot talk about climate change uh, with just one professional. We will, we will lost the opportunity, lose the opportunity to see all the things that are involved on that. And uh, I, I do work with uh, philosophers as well. I do work with nurses. I do work with pharmacists. I do work with community health workers and with my community because we cannot do that alone. It's not one, one woman thing. 
so uh, I, I cannot even think it if it's not like uh, across disciplines and in togetherness. Thanks, Mara. And uh, Ying Sun, would you like to comment on this one as well? Yeah, uh, so I think to provide better education for healthcare professionals, the, the approach has to be multi-sectoral. And a lot of training physician, pharmacists, and other healthcare professionals, they're controlled by at least like two major systems. One is the academic system, which is like the school part. Um, and in some universities, you can see they're, they're starting to have some kind of programs that to help students understand a little bit more about climate change. There are some do degree programs, certifications uh, that will allow their students for their, their health professional studies in climate change. For example, um, some schools have this combined MBH program uh, with a focus in environment science. So you like they learn side by side with epidemiologists as well as environmental scientists uh, to learn about climate change, how how this can and this probably can provide a better health education for uh, medical pharmacy and other healthcare students uh, on on the impact of health uh, sort of climate change. Um, so, but however, I, as I mentioned earlier, this should be like integrate. It should be integrated, not as a, like another course, not another degree, the student of the day. And I think speaking from my own university, like Columbia has this new, newly established climate school, which which is which is a really great idea. So I think if if integrated into the either the MD program or the pharmacy D program, would definitely to train a group of physicians, pharmacists, and other healthcare professionals that are better prepared for the future, where most of our patients are impacted by climate change in one way or another. Then also those have. Uh, we have the second part of the training, which is the, the, the resident program ordered by postgraduate trainings and arguably even more important than the school training, uh, since they teach about the practice of pharmacy, uh, practice of medicine. And yet this is a little, little bit more difficult to change because uh, because first of all, this is like limited by the funding and also like there is also some, some policy from, from the high up that needs to be changed. Therefore, I think it is essential to collaborate with the academia and the funding agency like the NIH in the US or the NHS in the UK, and as well as other, other funding agency for like different uh, residency program in, in different countries. And we also need to collaborate with policymakers to create this structural change and mandate climate change to be integrated in, in the training system. So we're like really happy to see that UK start to adopt this climate in uh, climate change in their curriculum. Um, Thanks, Ying. I'm actually, yeah. I will actually need to start to pull it together. Um, but thank you for that. And uh, in fact, I, I, I may pick up on the point that you were, we were about to make actually, but I note that we've had a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, if any of our panelists would like to sort of um, write back to our folks um, and, uh, but I, I certainly will try myself. Um, but I would just like to pick up on one of the points, which is the importance of the inclusion of uh, First Nations knowledge in our response. Uh, essentially, we, we must include um, First Nations knowledge if we're going to take a holistic, um, a holistic response to actually getting a healthy planet back. So um, I will just bring it together briefly before handing it on to Jenny. And so I'll just acknowledge this, the letter seeking um, system level change in the education of all health professionals to include climate change and health. Um, the letter also acknowledges the potential contribution of, acc acc of accreditation standards to achieve this. And th that's been referred to uh, this evening. Um, where accreditation standards exist for the health professions, they provide a really important lever through which you can affect change in a systematic way. And I, we've already had uh, highlighted to us the very encouraging example of the General Medical Council in the UK, which has included the environment as a determinant of health in their outcomes for medical graduates. And we've also seen shared tonight um, the, a draft curriculum for the UK. So essentially um, it's, it, it, it's an example of how through collaboration we all acknowledge that we can actually achieve more. Essentially, we all have scarce resources, but if we come together, we can actually meet this challenge of climate change. And I encourage everyone on the call to uh, engage with all the various resources, but to also get behind the launch of this letter. Um, over to you, Jenny. Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, 
And I just want to thank everyone who jo has joined us today for this event, who's interested in this topic and interested in carrying this forward. It's been really fabulous to see that there are folks on from all around the world and people are sharing additional information, and additional resources. That's exactly the sort of coming together and collaboration that we need to do to kind of move the needle on this and, and, and really get climate change embedded into health curricula across the, the spectrum of, of health specialties. Um, I want to say a special thanks to the members of the WHO Civil Society Working Group um, Subcommittee for Capacity Building that really um, envisioned developing this letter to lend the voice of uh, the health community worldwide to the effort to get climate change into the health curriculum. Um, and also just to note that um, amongst the speakers that we had on the, on the program today are a number of people who have been leading on this issue for, for quite a while. Uh, so we know that there are lots of people that are working on this issue in your um, geography, in your school, in your location. Um, in, in many instances when climate change has been successfully introduced into a curriculum, it is because there's been sometimes even just one passionate voice, passionate advocate for the issue that gets the issue going and gets it moving. Uh, one you know, major goal of this letter is to lend added weight to those efforts. So if you are that one voice who is pushing for this in your school, um, whether as a student, as a faculty member, or in leadership as a, as a dean of, of school. Um, this letter is here to kind of give you added, um, added backup that this is a call from the, the health community worldwide. It's not just your lone voice. Um, to that end, we want to continue, the capacity subcommittee wants to continue to support collaboration around these efforts. Um, we want to connect people who are concerned about this and working on this. Um, I believe that there will be a link shared in the chat where you can sign up if you're interested in staying connected. And if you're kind of at the student or faculty level, um, we wanna uh, provide opportunities for those who are kind of pushing for the issue in, in your schools to connect with one another, share information, um, share approaches, and, and help one, one another out. And if you are in leadership in a school uh, or in a, in a program, uh, we will connect you with the uh, Global Consortium, Cecilia's organization, who has, uh, they have a, an abundance of resources to help schools uh, you know, make the shift and, and actually incorporate this. Um, so with that, um, I don't know if we want to take the last couple of minutes to turn back for questions, or maybe I'll just turn it back to Ying for any final remarks from you. Um, thanks, Jenny, and, and thank you, Ling, and all the panel speakers for your insights and um, inspirations. And I have learned something more myself. Um, and, um, and thank you everyone for your um, participation and watch the space for further resources and actions from this group. And please feel free to um, get in touch and share any experience in using this um, uh, call and um, leveraging the um, global resources to influence your institutions and programs for more climate and health education. And um, I'm optimistic that if we work together, we can achieve our shared vision and um, build more capacity for all health professionals uh, in responding to climate change. And, and thank you very much. Um, we just end the, uh, the launch event um, formally now and um, take care everyone. Thank you.